Hi everyone, thanks for joining us and welcome to our talk about measuring documentation success in open source, where we'll share findings from the Google Season of Docs program. Before we begin, we'd like to introduce ourselves. My name is Cass and I'm the Season of Docs program manager, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Erin. Hi folks, I'm the Docs Advocacy Program Manager in Google's open source office. Here's a quick breakdown of what we'll review today. We'll start off with a brief history of Season of Docs, followed by a description of the 2021 program changes. Then Aaron will share our learnings from the 2021 program, and we'll end with letting you know how you can get involved in the program. So let's get started with some history. Season of Docs is in Google's open source programs office. The mission of Google open source is to bring all the value of open source to Google and all the resources of Google to open source. Google believes open source solves real world problems for everyone. And our open source programs office supports open source innovation, collaboration, and sustainability through our programs and services. And as previously mentioned, Season of Docs is one of these great programs. Season of Docs was started in 2019 by Sarah Maddox and Andrew Chen, and is a program that provides support for open source projects to improve their documentation and gives professional technical writers an opportunity to gain experience in open source. It aims to raise awareness of open source, docs, and technical writing. The goals of the program are really to give open source projects the opportunity to improve their docs and professional technical writers an opportunity to gain experience in open source. The program was initially modeled after Google Summer of Code, a program that provides mentorship to people new to open source. But we quickly realized that documentation projects needed a bit of a different structure. Google Summer of Code really teaches about open source norms and mentorship, while Season of Docs supports projects that have identified a documentation need and provides resources to meet that need. Participants in 2019 and 2020 were very satisfied with the program but we really wanted to find a way to share what projects had learned from their participation and what effect the documentation they created really had on their projects and communities. So in 2021, we decided to make some changes. The program continues to support better documentation in open source and provides opportunities for skilled technical writers to gain open source experience. However, it also builds on what we've learned from the successful 2019 and 2020 projects. We expanded our focus to include learning about effective metrics for evaluating open source documentation. Although our program goals remain pretty much the same, the program structure did change quite a bit. Our aim is to treat organizations more like partners. Organizations are now able to submit a project proposal and proposed budget, and we provide guides and support for them to better help them understand their documentation needs. We also provide funds via grants, for each documentation project. Each project receives anywhere from five to $15,000 depending on the needs of their project. Tech writers are also selected by orgs and Google really isn't involved in the selection process anymore, which still gives professional writers um, the opportunity to get some experience in open source. And lastly, organizations can now identify and track the metrics that matter for their documentation project. This data helps us better understand documentation impact and allows us to publish case studies so that we're able to share best practices. In addition to the benefits I just mentioned, we also have the following. We have actual data. Program participants are able to provide the metrics they value, which as previously mentioned, allows us to publish case studies and share best practices. We also get to treat organizations more like partners since we're now measuring success in partnership with organizations. The program is also a lot more sustainable from Google's point of view, since we spend our program admin time producing guides and research and not really processing applications anymore. We also have a lot less gatekeeping. Orgs can now work with their choice of technical writers and we actually have a lot less deadlines. Our timeline has been reduced in half if you compare it to years past. Lastly, we also have better compensation. By offering fewer higher value grants, projects are now able to give more appropriate compensation to professional technical writers. And now I'll pass it on to Erin so she can share some data from the 2021 program. Thanks, Cass. So uh, before I get started, I do wanna say that many projects are still collecting their metrics from the 2021 season. We'll have an update as we get the follow-up reports from projects. Lots of metrics just take time to measure. For example, SEO and community growth are not things that you can measure overnight. 
And some of the qualitative metrics are more difficult to gather. You have to put together a survey, you have to get the survey results, you have to analyze them. Now, these are the top metrics um, by number of projects setting the metrics. And I also called out the number of projects achieving each metric who had set them. And they're really kind of clumped into what they want to see less of and what they want to see more of. So unsurprisingly, projects want to have fewer complaints, fewer issues, fewer support requests. And they want more of those support questions to be able to be directly answered by documentation. This lessens strain on maintainers, and it makes it easier for people who want to get involved in a project to help themselves. They want more visitors to their documentation, usually measured by increased page views. They want more contributors, either to their documentation or to the project itself. And some projects wanted to measure a set number of new, doc, of new docs. And some projects wanted to measure not just more contributors, but actually concretely measure more pull requests, whether that's to the project itself or to the project documentation. Unsurprisingly, it was easiest to measure a set number of new docs created, and every project that set that as a metric achieved it. You can see that um, the projects achieving these metrics that were the top ones, they were generally pretty successful with more visitors and increased page views. Uh, the projects that said they had already achieved that metric was only about half. And more pull requests, the most difficult to measure or the most difficult to achieve at this point only one of the projects who had set that as a metric had achieved it by the point that they reported their case study. Now, the top doc types that projects said that they wanted to create or the top docs tasks that they wanted to undertake, a lot of people like to write tutorials. Um, docs reorganization and docs revision here are two separate articles, um, although lots of the projects that said that they wanted to reorganize their docs, that also included some revision. Projects wanted to create reference documentation. They wanted to produce examples. They wanted to produce how-to documentation. And interestingly, a new platform or format was kind of a stealth project embedded in a lot of the projects from the 2021 season. Several projects did not explicitly mention in their project descriptions that they were going to change their documentation format or their docs platform, but it was part of their results. And projects almost always said that changing their documentation format or switching to a new documentation platform was more difficult than they expected. So some of the takeaways from their write-ups, which you can see in their case studies, is that uh, projects said that if they had to do this again, they would reduce their scope. They would plan for fewer types of docs and fewer docs in general. They said they would want to make sure that their documentation production workflow was well understood before beginning their project. And for highly technical projects, having the technical writer focus on documentation structure and organization was more productive. Um, and when the docs, uh, when the technical writer focuses on documentation structure and organization, that frees up the project maintainers to work on examples where the technical writer might not have the domain knowledge necessary to produce examples or reference documentation. So the top recruitment, hiring, and just general work issues that the projects reported in their case studies. Obviously with the state of the world today, technical writers having to drop out either due to illness or because of other reasons why they were unable to complete the project that was the top issue reported by the organizations taking part in the 2021 season. There were also problems with communication channels or delays in the technical writer getting necessary information from the project. Um, project mentors were also affected by COVID and by just the world in general. And that was part of the, uh, part of the reason for technical writers not getting the information that they needed in a timely way. I mean, a project mentor is sick. There's really not much that you can do. Um, technical writing onboarding took longer than expected in many projects. Recruitment took longer than expected. The projects lacked infrastructure for hiring or payments, and the technical writer needed more time to learn project tools, which I think is also kind of connected to onboarding, but lots of projects separated that out into two, uh, two different uh, issues. Onboarding being like, how do we produce docs in our org? Project tools was mostly about using things like the build system for the project. Um, 
Some projects did not feel confident in their ability to evaluate technical writing applications or technical writing work product. And I want to call out a little bit about the projects needing to spend extra time understanding the payment process and communicating payment details and schedules with the technical writer. Half of this was everybody was using a new system. Half of this was organizations who had not previously paid people for work in open source, just had to generally um, spend more time to understand the ins and outs. So what we've learned so far that I wanna bring, especially to this audience, are some suggested strategies for technical writers who'd like to work with organizations participating in Google Season of Docs. Reach out early. The Season of Docs has a GitHub repo where interested organizations uh, express their interest even before they've submitted an application or been accepted. And if there's an organization that piques your interest, always reach out early and say, hey, if y'all are accepted, I'd be interested in working with you. Um, many of these organizations don't already have technical writers involved, so they don't even really know where to start. Um, you can also hang out in the Season of Docs channel in the Write the Docs Slack and indicate your interest there. Um, have a portfolio to share with relevant examples. I know sometimes this is hard for people who work on proprietary products um, where they can't necessarily share their, their work, but anything that you can share is helpful to let the organizations know what your work looks like. Highlight your tooling expertise. If you already know how to use GitHub, if you've already used some of the tools that the projects that you're interested in use, make sure that they know that. Um, and give critical feedback on the project proposals. This is probably the most important thing that you can do to show your expertise. Many projects highlighted that they changed their proposed work based on suggestions from the technical writers that they talked to and that they uh, ended up hiring. Because remember, you're the professional, you're the expert. They want your expertise, they want your help. You're not just there to check tasks off a checklist, you're there to work in partnership. They'll teach you about open source, You'll teach them about great documentation and you'll achieve the project goals and everybody will be happy and maybe even get a t-shirt. So we're not done analyzing the case studies. Um, there's a lot there and it's really interesting. Um, so our 2021 program report will include more summary data from the 30 case studies of the 2021 season. In 2021, all 30 organizations were successful in completing their work. So there's a lot of case studies to go through. All the case studies are now available on the Season of Docs website under previous seasons. So uh, if you want spoilers or you can't wait for the summary report, please feel free to go and dig into those case studies. And we'll announce on the Google Open Source blog at opensource.googleblog.com and on the Season of Docs announcement list and the Season of Docs Slack channel and the Write the Docs Slack when the summary uh, report is released. So Aaron just shared some great tips for getting involved in the program now, but here are some additional ones that would be helpful. So we're going to announce the 2023 program early next year, but in the meantime, you can check out our website. And as Aaron mentioned, read the 2021 case studies to see what other projects learned and what could apply to your project next year. If you're a tech writer, you may also want to add your info to our GitHub. Sometimes there are projects that need to change technical writers after the project is already kicked off and they may reach out to you. You can also join the discussion channels that Erin mentioned listed, and they're also listed on, on this slide to get the latest updates and announcements related to Season of Docs. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to us via email, or you can just stick around for the Q&A session that's following this one. Thanks for joining. Thanks, folks. We had such great, um, great responses to your talks from people who maybe um, just hadn't lived in the, the run book or the Google Season of Docs world. So I think it's great that you could come in and share what it's like for us. And we've got a whole bunch of questions, so I can jump right in. Um, uh, question number one, I guess, could be a run book one. I guess people were just kind of wondering, um, sort of the, maybe the definition or the scope of what you use runbooks for. So one question that we got a tons of thumbs up on was, do you only use runbooks for troubleshooting or would you include them for regular like how-to documentation as well? Alistair, do you want to take that one? Or you want me to <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, we, we have uh, procedural runbooks as well. So uh, when a customer asks to expand their, their resources, for instance, you follow a procedure for doing that. So yeah, internal documents, but how-tos as well. Great, thanks. 
Um, and I can go over to a Google question. Um, this one is from Jen. I found it was really interesting. Um, have you seen a change in kinds of projects that apply to Season of Docs? That's actually a really good question. Um, I don't, I feel like it's been pretty consistent. Um, Aaron, what do you think? I feel like it's been like a lot of, um, uh, gosh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, like how, to, uh, a lot of like how to documentation and but i feel like it's been consistent aaron what's what's your take on that i think you know uh every happy project is the same and every unhappy project is unhappy in different ways <laughs> so like <laughs> um we see projects from all sorts of different kinds of organizations like a lot of language focused projects like with python and julia and r and then also small tools and some very specific stuff, and also a lot of great projects from, say, the nonprofit world. There's some great stuff about um, food ingredients and teaching children across the world to read. So I think the only similarity is that they're all different. <laughs> That's what keeps it interesting, I guess, though. Great. Um, I've got a couple follow up questions, like uh, maybe the size and types of these. Um, of these projects, or um, Fabio just actually asked a question in the chat, um, small open source um, projects, like are there specific requirements you're looking for? I don't think that there's specific requirements that were like a specific type of project that we're looking for. I think what's most important is that you follow um, sort of the guides that we provide. I think that's uh, the first red flag for us when we're reviewing these applications is if you follow the um, the guides that were created by Aaron and I, um, and you provided all of the information that we are requesting, that's really, um, that gives you sort of the best opportunity to get selected for the program. If you're missing any of that information, that doesn't give us um, sort of the best idea of what your project is really aiming to to achieve and to do. And so it doesn't allow us to be like, okay, yeah, this is definitely a great fit for season of docs. So as long as you're following the guides, I think that any project really has the opportunity to, to join. Great, thanks. Um, and speaking of uh, requirements and project types, because I, I love an awkward, tenuous transition. Um, we had some questions about um, adapting runbooks to other industries. And as soon as I said that, I think that's not a transition, but we'll go with it. Um, are runbooks unique to software? I know we talked about this in the chat, but we like to uh, immortalize the answers in the recording. Um, are there equivalents to runbooks outside of software? Like um, biotech was one example, but I'm sure you thought about other ones maybe. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll jump on this one. Um, they're absolutely not unique to software. Um, anytime you want to take a task and ensure that it can be repeated successfully by anyone, you would want to create a, a run book effectively. Um, I've had them in previous careers, uh, all the way down to retail, all the way up to, you know, other, other corporate jobs and everything. Um, as some folks mentioned in the chat during our presentation, you know, they're extremely common in, uh, actual first responders' lives, uh, fire, EMS, things like that uh, at hospitals, certainly as well. There's documented procedures. So runbooks uh, definitely expand beyond just software. Great, thanks. Eric was also wondering if you've got any fun on-call stories from your teams, um, ways that runbooks were successful or failed, dot, 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 yes. <laughs> um, Without going into too many specifics, we did have a run book at one point in time that advised uh, basically toggling this extra feature that Dev believed was completely transitory and didn't impact the actual delivery of what we were trying to deploy at all. And it turns out that it was critical. And so turning it on sort of saved the day for the customer. We just didn't realize how lucky we had gotten um, until after the fact, someone uh, in engineering realized, oh, wow, there's dependencies between these two things. So thankfully, we set that when we were deploying that with the customer. Ooh, wow. <laughs> and there Great. have been examples of the opposite happening, right, where we discover something we didn't know and uh, quickly update a run book. So Alistair and I have been on calls late at night or even on the weekends occasionally to slip in a quick edit before more work is done. It's called iterating. We all do it. <laughs> it's it's normal. 
<laughs> Great, thank you. Um, speaking of guess things that maybe some bumps in the road that we all deal with um, for a season of docs, we had a question that said, were there issues with projects maybe not asking for or realizing what they really needed? So maybe um, somebody wants a tutorial, but they don't really realize that maybe the underlying issue is that they don't have any existing reference documentation. Erin, do you want to take this one? There were definitely some case studies where the project organizers said that kind of the basic gist was upon consultation with the technical writer that we hired, we changed. And that's a great, like, we think that's a great sign because we really think of this as a cooperation between technical writers and open source. So the fact that projects are willing to listen to feedback and to uh, take that feedback and act on it, it's great. And also, um, I feel like that's part of the ethos of open source, right? Everybody comes together and you all kind of steer the ship together. People don't generally just like, you know, grab the wheel and run. So <laughs> I would say that technical writers who want to participate in Season of Docs, if you see the application that the organization has made, and those are available for people to look at, and you can say, well, that sounds pretty good to me, but have you considered, go for it. Right? There's nothing to be lost by saying, what I really think you need is X. Great, thanks. We've also had quite a few questions about sort of the kind of people that you're looking for or um, what you're hoping that they're going to learn. So is it for interns, entry level, novice tech writers? We had one question um, asking that. Are you looking for full-time writers or um, are there small projects that somebody who already has a full-time um, job could handle? And uh, another one, sorry, in this clump, it's a bit of a big <laughs> question is, is it a good way to learn how to contribute to open source or should you already have open source um, or code experience? I'm wondering if maybe you could quickly just go into, is it for me? I think a lot of people are asking that right now. So it's absolutely a great way to learn how to contribute to open source. And for the majority of projects, you do not need to know how to code because they already are writing the code. They mostly need people to help their projects make sense to other people. It really depends on the project, whether uh, being an entry level or an intern or a novice technical writer is the right fit. And there is sometimes an issue where the organization doesn't really know what they need. And so if you are also very new to technical writing, you might not have the experience to guide them. If the project has worked with technical writers before and they have a pretty concrete project and they know how to hold your hand both through contributing to open source and the kinds of documentation that they believe that they need in order to achieve the goals that they have, then yes, it can be an appropriate um, way to gain technical writing experience. Um, but I should say that like participating in season in docs is not the only way to gain experience in open source technical writing. We accepted 30 projects last year. There are thousands of open source projects out there that you could go and volunteer for. Um, you can check them out, ask if they need help. You can do it outside of our program as well as within our program. And there was one other question that I just saw with, is there a need for experienced open source doc writers and practitioners? And I would say yes. In fact, we really want the experienced technical writers who have a little spare time, it doesn't have to be full time for the majority of these projects um, to participate. And the, Jessica suggested that maybe there's a consultation role that some experienced technical writers could provide. And I think that's a fascinating idea. And I may go back with Cass and with Ramina, who's our, our project lead starting with this current season and be like, hmm, how could we make this work in the future? Because um, we really want to bring the expertise that technical writers have to open source. Cass, did I leave anything out? No, I think you're entirely right. I think it really depends on the the organization, you know, what they're looking for. And I think we have seen the majority of technical writers that, um, at least recently, that that have been selected by orgs. They they do tend to have um, some experience. I don't think I've necessarily seen any interns or you know students, but um, that's not to say that the opportunity isn't there. I think it, it is entirely dependent on the org and what they're looking for um, and what their goals are. So yeah, I think you're, you hit all the points, Erin. Thank you.
And to bounce back to run books again, we had a clump of questions about how to maintain them. So maybe um, if you two could spend a couple minutes talking about the maintenance process, making sure things are up to date. We also had a couple of tooling questions. So um, do you use um, the same repo for it or um, the same platform? So lots of questions there. I think people just really wanted to, we had so many comments about Alistair's voice. So I think we just want to hear those dulcet tones again before we <laughs> break for lunch. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad to oblige. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in. The uh, uh, We would like to do more uh, regular reviews of our run books. Just, just for nothing, say, okay, take this cohort of run books and run them past reviewers again, do the, the uh, testing of the code examples. Um, we would like to do more of that than we do. Uh, but we use Confluence for uh, version control. So, and, and we are updating the, the run books uh, on a weekly or, or a monthly basis. So things tend to stay pretty fresh. Maybe you can add to that, Shane. Sure, I think in terms of practicality, we touched on it like uh, a little bit in the presentation. Um, I'm a strong proponent of embedding as a writer with the teams that I support. Like I want the engineers to see my face during sprint planning, to see my face during their weekly meetings. and potentially even see me you know, involved on uh, various calls or projects where they're deploying docs. Mm -hmm. And I think building that partnership with the teams you support helps or makes it easier to create feedback loops. Uh, Alistair and I have a lot of reliable folks who will ping us directly when they say, hey, I noticed something went out of date in a run book, or by the way, we have this change rolling out on this team. You should you know, reach out to said PM to get this aligned. So between the, the actual responses directly from the engineers and those communities that we build, our own project planning to you know, align with feature releases and all that, um, we keep these run books updated very frequently. Very cool, thanks. Um, and somebody had a question about user research. So do you run your run books through end user testing for iterations? What's your process on that? Um, is that something that you've done before? I guess I'll jump on this one too. Uh, yeah, absolutely, uh, especially with the alert run books, but we try to do UAT, which is user acceptance training with all of our run books. It's a criteria for publication. And uh, essentially during those UAT sessions, uh, engineers will take the doc and execute the task against uh, a test environment. And uh, ideally we'll be right there when they do it uh, or we'll collect feedback from them after the fact. It's also true that we every time uh, an alert uh, references a run book, we find that that we are potentially getting feedback on that run book. Mm -hmm. So it, it is kind of a constant process too. Uh, and I think lastly, we set up a uh, we use Jira at Splunk, so we created a uh, service portal where users can from a set of templates, you know, kind of request, hey, I need an updated doc, or I need a new doc, or I need updated diagrams or screenshots or whatnot. So we tried to make the, the submission process for update requests as easy as possible for our users too. Great. Well, thank you so much for your answers. It was so great to have you all here and live answering questions and interacting with people. I, I This is one of my favorite parts. And so I wanted to thank you for sharing what you know with the rest of us. We're so lucky to have you. Um, for everybody, just so you know, we're going to take an hour long lunch here. Um, you can chat with other attendees, post pictures of your lunch with the hashtag write the docs or take a walk outside if the weather is nice. Uh, we're also looking at lightning talks right after lunch. So if you are Sarah Shockey, Brian Klein, Gathri Krishnaswamy, Ryan Macklin, or Matt Reiner. We're so looking forward to see you talk. Um, in the meantime, I hope you have a great lunch. Thank you again to, your, um, to all of you for coming, and we'll see you at the Lightning Talks.